Members, the Minnesota House Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform will come to order. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani. Present. Vice Chair Frazier. Present. Representative Johnson. Present. Representative, uh, Representative Edelson. Present. Representative Feist. Representative Feist. Present, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Representative Grosso. Ali. Representative Grosso. Representative Hollins. Representative Hollins. Representative Hewitt. Present. Representative Cleborn. Present. Representative Long. Present. Representative Lucero. Very disappointed I missed National Twinkie Day yesterday. Representative Mueller. I don't have any Twinkies for you, I'm sorry. Representative Novotny. Present. Representative O'Neill. Present. Representative Pinto. Present. Representative Poston. Present. Representative Raleigh. Lee present. Representative Vang. Present. Representative Zhang. Present. Representative Grossel. Representative Hollins. That concludes roll call with 17 present. Very well. Uh, members, we do have a quorum. Uh, today's agenda is actually uh, quite simple. We're um, going to spend our time together uh, hearing uh, testimony uh, from uh, the public on House File 1070 as amended. Uh, we did that uh, yesterday and laid it over. That's uh, going to be this committee's omnibus uh, finance bill. Um, oh, uh, should always forget to do this. Uh, I wonder if our vice chair can move adoption of the April 6 minutes. So moved, chair. Very well. Representative Fraser moves adoption of the minutes of April 6. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All same sign. Motion prevails. The minutes of April 6 are adopted. Um, um, so, uh, members, uh, just to uh, very quickly, uh, again, uh, go through uh, the schedule. Um, yesterday, we had the uh, rollout of the of House File 1078. Uh, we did amend on the DE3 uh, amendment, uh, uh, basically just to put the, the bill in the shape that the, uh, the author, the chair in this case, uh, wishes it to uh, be before us as we mark it up. Uh, today, uh, we'll be taking uh, public testimony. Uh, also, during the course of today, amendments uh, to the DE will be due by 2 p.m., so we extended the traditional uh, hour out by uh, uh, two hours to do that. Uh, and then amendments to the amendments uh, will be due by 7 p.m. Uh, today. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we will uh, hold a... Um, longer meeting, um, and I don't have the hours right in front of me, but I think it's a good four hour meeting uh, where we will uh, do nothing but uh, take up those amendments, uh, debate them, um, and then uh, either vote them on or, or vote them out uh, as we mark up uh, the bill. And then we'll be taking a final vote uh, on the bill to forward it on uh, to Ways and Means. So the bills will not be up uh, before us today. It's been laid over uh, for that markup. Uh, tomorrow, um, as I said, today is uh, basically going to be spent uh, engaging with a diversity of voices um, relative to the 1078 uh, as amended um, in terms of giving us their uh, advice and their thoughts uh, on that. Uh, we had 23 people, which is terrific, uh, who have signed up to uh, uh, testify. Uh, it is my goal to get through all of them, but uh, we're going to need uh, help here, uh, which means uh, we're, we're not going to spend be able to spend a whole lot of time uh, in question and answer and debating uh, any of those points. Uh, we can save our debating for tomorrow. Uh, however, um, I will uh, exercise uh, you know some good judgment here as we go along to make sure that we can get some uh, at least a question or two in uh, from committee members. Uh, but please, I'm going to ask you right now off the bat. 
you know, if I can't get to your question on a particular um, testifier, it's because uh, we, we want to make sure all 23 have a chance uh, to testify. So with that, uh, members, we're going to start off uh, this hearing with our two um, commissioners because uh, uh, they need to get over to the other body uh, to also provide uh, testimony there um, uh, today on, on, um, on their omnibus bill. So with that, I'm going to call forward our um, Department of Corrections Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Paul Chiang. Welcome to the, com to the uh, committee, Commissioner. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Again, uh, thank you for the opportunity to just talk very briefly, and I will make sure it's very brief. I, I first of all, I want to thank the committee uh, for taking the action it did um, uh, on uh, the budget uh, that's been proposed. Um, the, the, I just want to highlight a couple of things that we think are really essential and critical. The, the base funding is uh, obviously one of the things that becomes really critically important as we look to maintain the stability of our organization and the services that we deliver. Uh, and that uh, has been um, fully funded and in accordance with that request, the safety and security of our, in our correctional facilities across our state. And I would just say that, that there's both critical policy updates. Um, some of these policies that have not been um, touched uh, from a legislative standpoint and in many, many decades, 45 years, uh, and, and the use of force, some of the use of force updates. Uh, again, we've only started that uh, since uh, really 1905. So we're talking about uh, timely and critically important uh, steps. Um, in addition, the funding to fulfill our oversight responsibilities across the state and correctional facilities and to carry out the OLA recommended security audit functions that we've had some opportunities to talk about um, and, and have uh, had the opportunity to work with Representative Johnson around uh, what that could begin to look like. Um, the Healthy Start Act, we're very excited about. This is something we've talked about before uh, and uh, we think is, is really a, a critical opportunity for us to reduce adverse childhood uh, experiences for, for uh, those children born to uh, women uh, facing incarceration or in incarceration. And we think that we can demonstrate um, good, both public safety outcomes, public health, and, um, and, and really help maintain uh, the values of, around the families. Uh, the, county, uh, the county supervision funding, um, we know that this has been an area where we've had discussion. Um, we're grateful that that, uh, that has been funded. I know that uh, this remains an area of concern and, and really importantly, that there's support of that uh, working group to come back to you uh, next year at the beginning of that session to, to uh, provide uh, some policy recommendations about how we make sure our system uh, of supervision and across our state is uh, adequately and uh, fairly funded. Uh, the IT costs uh, were built in and, and I wanna just point out uh, some people have asked those IT costs that were built in here really maintain the services as we have today. Um, uh, and But are really uh, critical, especially as we look to move the agency in the direction that I've had the chance to talk with all of you about. Um, the indeterminate sentence release board, this, this, the parole process, we think that this is, this is good shared governance uh, and uh, good public policy decision-making where we broaden the decisions and um, to a, a, a group of people who ultimately make these really critical, important uh, decisions that I think we all agree are significant. And your support of the juvenile justice data reporting or data repository uh, is also greatly appreciated. And we think that that will be highly informative for us both now and into the future. Um, I, I just, two quick final points. I, I want uh, to also just say I'm, how grateful I am about uh, the Minnesota Rehabilitation and, and Reinvestment Act. I know that's not uh, in the budget right now, but we look forward to implementing this policy, we hope. Um, we would love to be able to come back and, and have some of the savings that we can achieve uh, reflect both uh, investments and priorities for public safety and, and correctional services uh, in our state and at the same time um, provide a dividend back to uh, you all as policymakers and uh, uh, by returning dollars that can be used uh, in other sorts of way across uh, our state. Uh, so that general fund. Um, return. And then finally, I would say that if uh, with, with great with gratitude, I, I also uh, want to express some concern um, about the inclusion of some of the MinCore dollars uh, in this. 
Um, and I and I just want to say that I uh, while we understand that this is uh, this has been looked at as a resource before, um, I would only say that MinCor is it has to be self sufficient by statute and. Uh, these reserve uh, funds that we oftentimes uh, carry over uh, both give us some stability and we are allowed to carry over six months of operating to uh, to make sure that we can meet the needs and not use general fund dollars to, to do this. They also do some bonding uh, and equipment purchases that, that otherwise would be done through uh, the state bonding process, but uh, because this is self-sufficient, it has to be done on a cash basis. And so those reserve funds um, are important. It funds about 120 FTEs in the DOC and, and really provides uh, work and employment experiences and, and even small amounts of money for um, about 1,400 of, of our incarcerated population and, uh, and, and would it greatly increase our idle rates. Um, that said, I, I understand that the, the, uh, the challenges that your committee is, uh, is up against in terms of finding resources to meet the state's uh, broad public safety objectives. And with that, Mr. Chair, I just want to again say thank you, and I would stand for any questions that you or others may have. Thank you, uh, commissioners, uh, commissioner rather. Uh, any uh, quick questions or comments from committee members? I'm not uh, seeing any. I, I do uh, very quickly. Uh, I, I want, want you to know I hear you on the Mincor uh, reserves, and uh, assuming this bill uh, moves forward, I look forward to continuing to work with you uh, relative to uh, that issue. And um, and I also just want to, on the record, express my own, um, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, it's, it's excitement, but I mean, uh, you know, just support and, um, um, uh, you know, encouragement for the uh, MMRA uh, proposal that uh, your administration that has worked that I do believe that's uh, you know the future of corrections uh, in the state and across the nation and uh, uh, the dividends that it can pay off in multiple ways is uh, you know truly vis uh, visionary and and uh, um, truly helpful uh, to our state so thank you uh, for thank that you, Mr. Chair and thanks committee members all right thank you uh, next we have um, Department of Public Safety and so we have uh, the commissioner uh, Commissioner John Harrington. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, if you can come forward, um, give us your testimony. Uh, we'll look forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is John Harrington. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. I want to thank you for allowing me to testify today and your flexibility as I work to be in two committees and a Homeland Security meeting all at the same time. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I also want to thank you for funding many of Governor Wall's budget priorities in your bill. I appreciate the investments you're making in my department. And I want you to know it's not something that I take lightly. These investments have already been turned into operational uh, realities with human trafficking investigations, partner with the trust group up north, holding several men accountable who are seeking to prey on Minnesota girls. We've already, uh, we already have a person in place at the BCA for the family liaison, and the use of force unit is even busier than we expected, unfortunately. Uh, the, invest the investments you make in your bill will continue to work, uh, but again, that with community conversations, and that, that's really where I anchor my, my work from back in my police days, is working with the community, and those community conversations, conversations with moms and dads and others in the community that have lost loved ones to violent crime in so many different ways, led ultimately to the Deadly Force Encounters Working Group. And, and that working group's uh, activities are going to continue moving Minnesota even further on the path of both community policing and what I hope is increased community safety. Police accountability is one of the things that I've anchored my career on, and I appreciate your work on uh, funding police accountability via body cameras. Uh, it's one of my top priorities. And your conclusion is that funding to invest in the cameras and the ongoing need for data storage. While it's not a huge budget item uh, in the overall scope of things, I really do believe it's a significant impact. Uh, it will continue to build trust between the police and the communities that they serve. Uh, it will help us clear officers who are wrongly accused, but it'll also support chiefs and sheriffs who've told me over and over again, their desire to sanction misconduct if they have evidence that they can use. Uh, DPS has taken on a very victim-centric approach, and I appreciate the uh, Office of Justice Program budget items that you've made into ongoing funding, uh, and both the depth and the breadth of program areas that you're covering. Uh, there is no one-size-fits-all solution, uh, and, but OJP really does try and reach, whether it's general crime victims, domestic violence victims, sexual assault victims, child abuse victims, they really try and make sure that all victims in the state of Minnesota have a place to come to uh, at the Department of Public Safety. 
uh, we really do believe that these efforts will help keep victims, especially those, and we've seen an increase in domestic violence over the course of the pandemic. Uh, and we've also seen additional crimes against children over the internet. Uh, also, uh, seems like there's a rising tide of sex offenses, both internet crimes and uh, and actual uh, violent crimes against children that we wanna see uh, take a victim-centric approach to both stop the offenders, but also to help the victims recover. I'm hopeful that this year we'll see, uh, be able to pass uh, some laws that we've talked about, about driving after revocation and driving after suspension. Uh, I want to thank you for putting those pieces in your bill. I really do think they are incredibly important to improving both equity and, just as importantly, reducing the collateral consequences of, uh, of, of holding people accountable. We do believe in holding people accountable, but that shouldn't mean that a person who is uh, struggling at the, at the margins uh, is cut off from their ability to go to work or to make, their, you know, to make their daily bread or to be able to take care of their children or continue their education. Uh, in the area of Homeland Security, as I mentioned, I was just got off the call with them. Um, I just note that there have been over 100 mass shootings in the U.S. since the start of this year. Uh, and Maryland had another one yesterday. It seems like every day we're seeing another, uh, another atrocity uh, committed uh, where there's gun violence. Uh, the School Safety Center uh, at Department of Homeland Security uh, and Emergency Management has been really under uh, great demand uh, as teachers and admins are starting to return to their buildings. Uh, and they see those reports and they recognize that uh, not too long ago, that was where we were most concerned about an active shooter was in our schools. And uh, the two FTEs continued funding will make a significant impact on schools ability to be ready. Uh, and I really do appreciate you making those two prisons permanent. Uh, back to Office of Justice program. Um, uh, while I know this is a budget year uh, and we, we, we got to get the budget done, I do appreciate you uh, looking at our uh, policy initiatives and including them in your bill. Uh, I will note that there's a letter that I've sent uh, that talks to, speaks to the whole issue of investing in uh, DPS's juvenile justice uh, approach. Uh, we are the we are the designated agency for coordinating uh, juvenile justice work, and we really do believe that uh, we need to, this funding and we need this work so that we can keep young people from ever getting into the system. Uh, we think that's really where we should do our investment. And so I would hope that uh, you and your members will have a chance to read that letter um, because I really do believe that we need to do a better job of serving our young people in Minnesota. Uh, the BCA funding for drug driving is an incredibly important piece to our roadways. Um, uh, we're 152 days behind, and that's the turnaround time for testing for DUI and driving while intoxicated or driving while drug cases. Uh, we know that, you know, the right to a, a, a speedy trial is, is an important component of that. The pandemic has certainly slowed that down, but we really cannot afford to have the lab results being the difference between holding people accountable and keeping drunk drivers or drug drivers off the road. Uh, cybersecurity is also a, an issue that comes up. Um, we had thousands of cyber cases last year at the BCA, and I appreciate you continuing to sort of work toward our, our cybersecurity at the BCA. Uh, the initiative was partially funded in the last biennium, and it's, if you get some more partial funding in your current bill, uh, I would tell you that the funding we have here would still not uh, be adequate to completely uh, address all of the issues that the feds and others have identified for us in terms of cybersecurity. We would have to reduce some of our FTEs even, within, with, even with the funding. So while I appreciate the funding, I am uh, still hopeful that we can have a conversation about how we do that in a way that addresses our critical infrastructure needs at a time when uh, cybersecurity is still uh, not anything. I spend each morning uh, being briefed on the latest phishing attack or ransomware attack. And that was yesterday's meeting with the uh, Homeland Security, Secretary of Homeland Security. That was one of the items that he identified as a national issue that the feds are going to be taking on. And we need to be working with them on ransomware because we've already seen it happen here. Um, finally, uh, the area that I'm most concerned about, and they're all concerns, but this is one I think is, uh, is close to heart uh, is the lack of funding for the criminal information and operations section, or also known as the Fusion Center. I really do believe that not funding that uh, fully does leave Minnesota vulnerable. I can tell you I've been getting calls from the Jewish community, the Muslim community, Christian groups, all concerned about hate crimes, uh, concerned about domestic violent extremists, and the BCA's Fusion Center is the heart of our taking a, st a step forward to identify, interdict, and attack hate crimes in Minnesota. Uh, without this funding, the BCA's Fusion Center will continue to provide limited support, primarily during bankers' hours. Unfortunately, uh, 
folks that do this kind of the hate crime, uh, whether it's after hours or overnight, we need to be on that as quickly as possible to be able to respond and identify the threat and hopefully be able to, to put the right pieces in place so that threat never comes to fruition. I, I can tell you that uh, BCA's fusion center has been used during Fogelbit. It's been doing part of the civil unrest. Uh, threat assessments to our schools, our faith-based institutions all go through the fusion center. And so we really do believe it is a critical component to them. Uh, their mission is to collect, analyze, and disseminate that information that helps communities across Minnesota make informed public safety decisions. And we really do think that an investment in the BCA's Fusion Center is an investment in all communities across Minnesota. With that, I will close. Uh, I am happy to answer any questions, uh, and I serve at your pleasure. Very well. Um, members, any questions, comments? Uh, I'm not seeing any, but uh, let me just uh, slow down uh, uh, a little bit here I, just to uh, uh, interact with you on a couple of, of, of things. So one, um, uh, I'm really thankful for the work uh, the department uh, is involved in with human trafficking uh, in our state. I think anyone who serves on this committee for a short period of time um, is probably shocked um, and powerfully moved by um, you know, the prevalence, the ongoing prevalence of, of that uh, uh, horrific uh, crime um, that stretches back, you know, um, for many, many generations and takes on all sorts of new iterations. And so it's good to have a uh, public safety um, uh, state um, um, uh, agency that, that's focused uh, on that. I also just very quickly uh, want to echo your comments on body cams uh, it, for me, it is uh, rather interesting uh, and empowering uh, that, you know, that's one of the areas where there's just a lot of, of, of consensus, if you will, uh, in terms of the, its importance uh, for so many stakeholders, whether you're a licensed peace officer or uh, a community activist who's concerned uh, with uh, uh, some of the actions of some of our officers. Uh, it's a powerful uh, instrument, I think, uh, that we're still learning how as a society to use. Um, I, I totally get that uh, the numbers that we put in this bill is not going to be sufficient uh, uh, to meet the state's uh, needs, but I, I felt very strongly that we got, we have to stop kicking the can down the road and, and get a start uh, uh, on that. Um, on the, um, uh, just two very quick uh, questions. The um, the, the drug driving uh, lab test uh, turnaround, I, I, I thought we had done some uh, laboratory um, or lab testing investments um, in, in recent years. I know we did, but it sounds like we're still playing a pretty uh, big catch up role. Uh, did we just simply fall that far behind, um, you know, over the last, um, I don't know, over the last several years uh, prior to uh, making those kind of investments in the last uh, investment? Are there less uh, appropriations? Mr. Chair, I, I can answer that quickly. Uh, we invested in uh, opioid testing in particular and regard in response to the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our uh, testing was in regards to uh, overdose cases or cases that involve specifically narcotics. Uh, and so DUI cases typically were prioritized at a lower level. Uh, we also then prioritized uh, sex offense cases until our biologic unit was staffed up uh, to be able to take uh, account of all of the sex kits that were coming to the BCA for yep. testing. And so those two areas of the laboratory were, were enhanced. Uh, the area that focuses on traffic uh, was not enhanced at that time. Okay, got it. And of course, in this bill, you know, we're running with your recommendations, uh, you know, uh, on that. It, it, it just, to me, part of it, what I'm hearing is that you know, as the conditions change, perhaps, and evolve out in, in, um, uh, in our society, including the need to focus um, on, uh, you know, particular, uh, you know, crimes that, um, um, you know, it begs the question about having the capacity, um, you know, to, uh, to do proper lab testing, which has everything to do with whether or not we, we're going to have a functional judiciary system. Uh, to adjudicate, um, you know, those issues. Then the final thing really quickly, and I'll turn to Representative Johnson because I, I saw his hand just pop up. Just on the Fusion Center, uh, you certainly have my commitment to continue having this conversation uh, with you uh, as, as this bill moves over or moves uh, forward. Uh, very quickly, we don't have to get super in depth, uh, but, you know, one of the things that I noted uh, as we looked at 
um, the, uh, the request was uh, a growth of 18 FTEs. I think you're currently at six, and I think a number of those are part-time um, FTEs. And so, you know, it, 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 terribly concerned around that kind of growth, um, uh, but perhaps I shouldn't be. Um, and, and so just a quick opportunity for you to, you know, to speak to that uh, here and publicly. And then also uh, my other uh, you know, quick question is that it seems to me that this has been primarily a federal responsibility This flowed out of the 911 uh, you know, uh, uh, need, uh, uh, which partly uh, informed our society that our federal government really needed to step up um, uh, because states were not in a position um, to do the work that they could do. Um, you, know, you know, with international connections, cross state issues, you know, et cetera. Uh, why would this not continue to be a federal responsibility? Uh, Mr. Chair, great question. And in fact, yeah, Secretary Mayorkas uh, addressed that question yesterday as we were being briefed with him on Homeland Security as he talked about the need to enhance uh, fusion centers across the United States. The fusion center was created in the wake of 9 11. And it was primarily focused at that time on international terrorism as we were trying to figure out uh, how were uh, the terrorists that took down the World Trade Center able to operate it in the United States. Uh, it was a, uh, a small funding portion uh, that allowed us to really to establish a day shift and to coordinate with, with our federal, uh, federal partners. Uh, since 9-11 though, uh, today we are faced with cybersecurity threats, school safety threats, active shooter threats, uh, domestic violent extremist threats, white supremacist and racially motivated extremist threats, all of which have gotten added onto the plate of the Fusion Center. And while we do not believe that we can stop taking a look at our international issues, uh, we continue to work with the Joint Terrorism Task Force and others uh, via, via that, all these other issues have now become uh, more and more uh, top of plate. And we have not increased, neither the federal government nor the state has increased the staffing to respond to the growing list of uh, violent extremist concerns that both the United States is facing and that the state of Minnesota is also facing. So that, I think, is why uh, the six made maybe some sense in, when it was first funded, uh, but we have not seen growth from the federal side of that. And I'm hopeful that we will actually, from our federal partners, see some growth uh, as they talk about the, the, their conversation with FBI speaks to uh, issues around how can we address domestic violent extremists as it's our number one threat these days, rather than foreign extreme activity. All right, well, that's very helpful. And I know you got to run, but I, uh, Representative Johnson, uh, I think we can get into a very quick uh, question or comment, and then uh, we'll let you get on to the next um, uh, testimony in the next uh, committee. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, you brought up the issue. I was going to talk talk about the Fusion Center. Um, it came after 9-11 when they found out all the barriers were up between intelligence agencies, not just at the federal level, but even at the state level where information wasn't getting passed along. Uh, this was put together by the federal government, um, funded by the, a good portion of it funded by the federal government. But unfortunately, this biennium, uh, the federal government decided not to uh, do their their funding and left it all up to the states. While uh, the federal government is still gets all the information, but they don't bring anything back. So until they, uh, I don't think we should be funding the federal government for their intelligence if they're not uh, helping us as well. All right, well, valid points. Um, members, we're gonna push on. Uh, thank you again, um, uh, Commissioner. Um, and I will go quicker. I just really, members wanted to slow down in this particularly with the uh, commissioners. Uh, because they cover so many issues, uh, and in particular with DPS, because the uh, DE3 amendment um, uh, did not accept a number of, of, of their proposals, including uh, the fusion center. So I just really want to air that out a little bit. Uh, but I do want to uh, keep moving. And so next we have uh, Director Wrights, uh, Nate Wrights, uh, Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines. Uh, uh, Director Wrights. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Nate Wrights. I am the Executive Director of the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Uh, before I begin talking about what I wanted to talk about, which is um, Article 6, Section 1 of, of the Omnibus Bill, I, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to you, Mr. Chair, and to the committee for considering fully funding the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. 
and uh, we hope to continue to do our good work um, through through the next biennial. Uh, but I wanted to address you today to express uh, MSGC staff's concerns with this particular provision, which is on page 129 of the Omnibus Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Bill. It's from the first engrossment to House File 901, and I apologize, I was not aware of it at the time that that was being uh, amended, so I, I did not make any comments at that time. But, but the new provision requires uh, my agency annually to summarize and analyze prosecutor-initiated sentence adjustments, which are provided for under Article 6, Section 9 of the bill, which is on page 137. Um, unfortunately, as it's written, uh, MSGC staff would have no way of complying with the bill's requirements because we would not have the data that we would need to produce the report that is required. Um, so there's an example in uh, 60911, we are required to report county attorney's firearms data. Uh, the way we're able to do it is because there's the provision in 60911 that um, has uh, a reporting requirement imposed on the county attorneys. They have to send us the data and then we report and analyze it and present it to the legislature. But there's no such provision in this bill that, that requires county attorneys to provide it to us. And it's not the sort of data that we would normally have. We, we, we have a lot of data on the sentencing event, but this is really something that happens after sentencing when the prosecutor initiates a petition to change the sentence after the fact. So there's two ways that the, that the legislature could resolve this problem. Uh, one is by simply deleting Article 6, Section 1. Uh, alternatively, the problem could be resolved by amending Article 6, Section 1 to limit the scope of the summary and analysis to those cases in which the defendant was convicted of a felony offense, because we wouldn't have a lot of the data that's required for misdemeanor and gross misdemeanor offenses. And second, amending Article 6, Section 9 to require each county attorney to report no later than uh, July 31st of each year, um, uh, it, similar to the, the uh, 6 and 9 11 reports, a number of pieces of information to the MSGC. And, and I can pr prepare those and, and in writing and submit those to Mr. Lundy. Um, and I've already provided those to uh, Representative Mueller. Um, unfortunately, didn't have much advance warning for her because uh, she was the bill author of House File 901. Um, but, but things like the district court case number, what, what the defendant's name is, original sentence date, uh, what count number is involved, when the, the county attorney petitioned for, for the sentence adjustment, um, what the county attorney requested, what the court did about it, and when the court did that. Um, so so that, that if we had all that data and the county attorneys were required to provide that data, we could um, summarize it and report as required in the bill. I should finally say, Mr. Chair, that uh, my testimony reflects only the views of uh, Minnesota Sentencing Gui Guidelines Commission staff. It does not reflect the views of the commission itself. It does not necessarily reflect the views of the commission itself. They have not had a chance to meet about this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Subject to your questions, that's all I have. Thank you, uh, direct, uh, thank you Director Wrights, and thank you for uh, the practical advice. If, if you could, in fact, uh, forward language for our committee administrator, uh, let's circle back and have that uh, conversation. We certainly don't want to forward legislation. It's just um, impractical to do. Um, and so um, so let's work on that. Um, I'm very grateful for the work of the uh, Sentencing Guidelines Commission. You, you, you all have a pretty big plate in front of you. And, and if I remember right, I think your commissioners are all volunteers. I don't think they get paid to be commission, uh, uh, Sentencing Guidelines Commissioner. Is that correct? They, they get mileage, and and the the three public members get a whopping fifty dollars a meeting, Mr. Chair. How about that? You might might squeeze out a few uh, cups of coffee at Starbucks uh, occasionally uh, with that. Representative Johnson, I see your hand is still up, or is that for this or from prior? Nope. Um, all right, Director Wrights, thank you uh, very much. Uh, with that, members, we're going to move on to the uh, post board, uh, and uh, we've got uh, uh, Director Eric uh, Missel. Welcome. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Uh, just a few brief comments on uh, <clears throat> the budget uh, piece for the post board. And uh, I know it it's, sounds uh, um, pretty cliche at this point. I'm hearing everybody say thank you, but I, I'm just going to echo that and um, say thank you to all of you for your support of the board um, in what has been a trying uh, year plus. Um, and uh, that support is clearly um, 
reflected in the in the budget request here that uh, this committee is supporting. So I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to uh, particularly uh, talk about the increased staffing, which was put in the uh, the governor's uh, budget recommendation, and also is included in the in the bill here. Um, and talk a little bit about what that will enable us to do. Um, the, the as you know, I think everybody knows here, particularly being in this committee, a lot has been asked of the post board. A lot of questions have been raised, and rightfully so. Um, and we've done our best to uh, try and uh, address that. But at the end of the day, as I think a lot of people, have, they learn more about the post board as I've grown into this position, we've come to understand that uh, it's very difficult to meet um, the, new, the new requirements and, and what is being asked of us with uh, the way we were structured and staffed. So this directly addresses that. And I am confident that if we can get this through, um, we will be in a much better position to not only be more responsive, uh, and uh, transparent in, in what the post board does and what our role is, but it will also allow us to be proactive uh, going into the future, uh, looking at different um, areas where maybe the post board hasn't operated in the past. Um, more specifically, uh, and as, as one example, with regard to compliance reviews for agencies, you know, statute says that uh, we do compliance reviews annually, and that is right now currently a very basic kind of reporting of allegations of misconduct and um, uh, and policy compliance. Uh, adding these staff uh, that are included in the in the budget item would allow us to uh, do a more comprehensive, better review um, every year uh, with the additional uh, standards coordinators and um, meet our actual statutory requirement of doing uh, more robust annual reviews every year, which has been a concern voiced by um, by certainly the, the community and uh, the public at large. Um, so that that is an important piece. We also, uh, harkening back to the reform legislation, I mentioned several times, I think in this committee and others, we're working on the, the database, of course, for complaints, but also the second half of the year will be the building of the training uh, the training providers, uh, training courses, tracking those. And uh, to that end, I also want to mention, I know it's included in here as part of the funding, uh, the continued funding of the training uh, dollars, the $6 million training dollars annually. Uh, I just want to mention too that from a post perspective, we have no objection to any of the requirements in there in terms of um, the courses and when they get reviewed and all that. That's going to be part and parcel of uh, what we do when we develop the uh, database in the second half of 2021. So I'll just put that out there as well. Um, and I'll just close by saying that I think uh, things are changing obviously uh, with the profession and of course the expectations of post board. Um, and I believe citizens have to have confidence that there are clear standards of professionalism as well as consist consistently administer training and best practices across police service in the state. They must have confidence that the post board is ensuring that professional standards are constantly being reviewed, updated and upheld through training and accountability. I don't wanna forget about the peace officers, obviously uh, a critical part of this entire endeavor that the post board is involved in. And I believe that local agencies and peace officers themselves must have confidence that they are part of a profession that meets high standards and ensures that the most relevant productive training uh, is available to keep them safe in their jobs. Minnesota's peace officers divert, deserve a profession that supports those who do the job ethically and properly and ensures that those that do not are not allowed into the profession in the first place or are held accountable for failure to uphold the high standards that they meet every day. This requested expansion will allow the post board to address both recommendations, both short and long term, in the IADLIS audit that we did, uh, current statutory changes that increase the work and responsibility of the post board. And it will give us the capacity, as I mentioned, to address future legislation, as well as take proactive action on, on issues such as statewide accreditation for agencies and also researching best practices. That's what I would do. So with that, that concludes my remarks, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, uh, Director uh, Missile. Uh, members, questions, comments? Um, not uh, seeing any, uh, Director Missile, uh, I, I do want to echo your uh, how you opened up with uh, 
boy, a whole lot of attention on Pulse. I think most Minnesotans uh, were, couldn't name what Pulse was. I think that's changed quite a bit. And, and actually, I think it's a good thing. I, I think Pulse uh, plays a very important role in the constant need to have a good uh, trust in our public safety systems, uh, particularly in our law enforcement systems. Uh, we can only be effective, uh, it seemed, to me anyway, it seems, to the degree that there's a strong level of trust uh, uh, within the uh, within the profession and uh, with the profession and and uh, the citizen citizen read. I know that that sometimes uh, will come with uh, attention. Um, I think it's important that that be a healthy attention, and we look to you and your colleagues to provide us with you know good guidance and direction and advice on on how to um, uh, maintain a, an empowering, respectful, uh, but uh, uh, always uh, focused on. Um, the uh, uh, the well-being and the um, the trust that's so necessary to make sure that law enforcement is effective for us. So thank you, thank you for your work, and thanks to all the commissioners there. Uh, good luck as you continue uh, carrying out your audit uh, 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 recommendations uh, this year. Well, with that, members, we're going to move on to Rich uh, Newmeister, a citizen activist. Uh, Rich, uh, come forward. State your name to the record, give us your testimony. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Rich Neumeister and I am representing myself. 14 years ago, when the Minnesota Fusion Center was created, then known as the Minnesota Joint Analysis Center, it had a governing body, which it does not have now. It had a privacy group, which I was a part of, which it does not have now. That group, the privacy group, which I sat on along with others, Chuck Samuelson, a couple other folks from long ago, we, uh, we suggested policies and guidelines for data sharing and all that, and that was implemented. I, in my supplementing my letter to you, you have also a copy of that current policy, which they just revised from 10 years ago. It is clear through public documentation that fusion centers across the country have a history of civil liberties and privacy violations. They're an equal opportunity surveiller and monitor with all kinds of groups and individuals, no matter what the pro political persuasion is. Has the Minnesota Fusion Center done the same? The general answer is we really do not know. We do know 10 years ago that the Minnesota Fusion Center, Bloomington Police Department, and the Mall of America were involved in collecting hundreds and hundreds of suspicious activity reports on people who looked different, who had different sounding names than the traditional white American and National Public Radio, the Center for Investigative Research and National Public, uh, Minnesota Public Radio has done a lot of work on that. After that, there was a veil of secrecy that happened over MinJAC, now the Minnesota Fusion Center. And there were only audits over the last decade of the Minnesota Fusion Center. You have one of them, which is uh, a part of, again, my testimony. The other one said, was done by Dessel Peterson, the D Data Practices Audit Report, of MinJAC at that time, January 29th, 2010. This report showed that the Fusion Center at the time had a number of files that did not adhere to the standards. Meaningful transparency is not there for the public or policymakers. The public and legislators cannot assess currently how the Fusion Center has functioned and compromised Minnesotans' privacy. Will we be able to do so in the future? Unless the legislature builds in hardy, accountable and transparency standards in law, the veil of secrecy will continue. I've talked to Superintendent Drew Evans and Super, uh, Commissioner Harrington over the years on these kinds of issues. And they, to some extent, raise objections to a powerful accountability and transparency standards. Trust us that the emphasis will be. But if you take a look at their long time record, which I've been around a long time, and it's also articulated in the letter I've sent to you, you'll see that there've been issues of with MGNO 15 years ago where a former representative, Mary Liz Holberg, was listed as a suspect wrongly. You'll see the involvement of gang net used by law enforcement databases that I was involved in with getting out to the newspapers and all that by my data request. Also at the same time, the Stingray, which some of you might be familiar with from the last few years. All these are documented in the, and you'll see the links on the paper. It's either you have it, uh, members in your packet or how you all do all that stuff these days, or you know on the website. In summary, the Minnesota Fusion Center is asking for millions of taxpayer dollars to enhance its ability to data share, collect and analyze information. 
There is history and documentation of fusion centers such as Minnesota stepping over the line. There's also a history with the institution of law enforcement nationally and locally of compromising individual rights. I am interested as I know you are to be confident that the BCA MFC does not transgress their boundaries or go into mission creep mode. I suggest the following, a governing board, also independent audits, annual report, and also a robust website. There are more details in, in, in the item that I have written for you that I thought you were all gonna testify, you know, hear testimony last year or last week. It's on the website or it's already been given to you. I'm willing to help at any time with details as to what language could be to be inserted into the appropriation bill. I'm much obliged for your time and consideration. I'm interested, I think there's a need, but we also have to have robust accountability and transparency if they're gonna get the millions of dollars to prevent the happenings that have happened in other fusion centers across the country. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm very much obliged to you for your time. Very well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Dumeister. Uh, I, I did read your letter, some very good uh, uh, recommendations and um, uh, we'll be following up uh, uh, with the uh, department uh, relative uh, to those um, members. Uh, Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I didn't know, I had my hand up earlier when uh, the commissioner was on uh, during the Fusion Center conversation. So I didn't know quite when to, to fit this in, but I appreciate uh, the conversation that we've had uh, several testifiers on the Fusion Center. And uh, just real briefly, I, I don't agree with everything that Mr. Neumeister said, but uh, I do share the concern in regards to the Fusion Center. As somebody who's in cybersecurity myself, the you know we in cybersecurity, when it comes to data networks, we are watching the rest of the network. We're watching for anomalous activity. We're watching for unauthorized access. We're watching for behaviors that, that need to be enforced. So cybersecurity essentially is law enforcement, law enforcement in the digital space. So I share the sentiment of, of definitely needing to watch and, and enforce standards and, and uh, that entire realm. But the question is often asked of those of us in, in cybersecurity space is who's watching you? Who's watching the watchers? And so when it comes to the fusion center, right, I completely understand the, the need in, in society where we need to, to, to have data and be looking at data and be looking for anomalous activities that might pose a threat. But at the same time, we have to be cognizant of the competing force, which is not creating an atmosphere that creates a chilling effect on the on free citizens of exercising their individual liberties and constitutional rights. And so again, I just wanted to, to express that I, I do have concerns in, in regards to the Fusion Center. I appreciate the, the airing of these concerns. Um, I share the concerns and this is something we just need to be very diligent. And in this aspect, make sure that we're holding accountable and, and having the same philosophy of who's watching the watchers. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Very well, well said, uh, Representative Lucero, uh, and no doubt will be will continue to be part of the conversation as this uh, uh, bill uh, moves forward. Regardless of us uh, not funding it in the bill right now, there is a fusion center, and so uh, those issues are still quite relevant. Thank you, uh, Mr. Newmeister, for stimulating our thought and discussion uh, on, in this area. Next, we have uh, Chris Weiland uh, from Restore the Fourth Minnesota. Hey, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, indeed, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee for taking the time to hear my testimony. Uh, my name is Chris Wayland. I am a freelance IT worker and a the co-chair of Restore the Fourth Minnesota. Um, Restore the Fourth is a national grassroots organization and we advocate against mass surveillance. Um, we've been around since the Snowden revelations in 2013. Um, I was happy to see uh, just like Mr. Neumeister, I'm here to testify about the Fusion Center stuff. And I was happy to see that the funding for it was removed from the uh, DE amendment. Um, Fusion Centers are relatively little known in the public consciousness, but since their inception, they has served as great enablers of digital general warrants, um, which are one of those fundamental civil liberties violations that the founders fought so hard against. And it's why the Fourth Amendment was included in the Constitution is this idea that when law enforcement expresses its power, it should only do so when there is reasonable suspicion that a, that a 
particular crime has been committed and having a fusion center that is plugged into digital infrastructure and is just and is performing these kinds of um, and performing a great deal of dragnet um, online surveillance is very concerning to me as a Fourth Amendment advocate. Um, one thing that I would like to highlight, um, Rich Newmeister highlighted the issue with um, the Fusion Center and the Mall of America. There were some issues in the during the 2009 or 2008 RNC. There's been all kinds of nationwide issues with Fusion Centers. But one thing that I would like to highlight um, more recently is that uh, one is a cybersecurity issue in that uh, in 2020, the Fusion Center, there was the Blue Leaks hack, which... Uh, in which hackers broke into the vendor that was providing services for fusion centers nationwide, including the Minnesota Fusion Center. And it leaked, um, they just dumped the personal information of, I think it was more than 70,000 uh, law enforcement agents and all of the, and, and a great number of the people that they were um, investigating. And uh, what it shows is that I don't think that these I don't think that these agencies have the capacity to defend their infrastructure in such a way. Um, data is a fundamentally toxic asset. Uh, and one of the best ways to prevent toxic spills is to simply not collect it in the first place. Um, in our more recent, and from the, from the public leak though, we did learn that right after the killing of George Floyd, the Minnesota Fusion Center exaggerated threats and descriptions of suspicious behaviors reports to law enforcement agencies. And they were stoking fears and setting the stage for the Minneapolis police's widely condemned overuse of tear gas, um, concussion grenades, and rubber bullets. And um, Minneapolis police were receiving these reports of all of these vague social media threats against law enforcement officers, and that sort of set the stage for that violence. Um, after the events of 2020 and 2021, um, in, in January 21, this like understandable pressure to increase spending on these kinds of things, but considering fusion centers and other federal programs documented lack, they have a lack of effectiveness, lack of public accountability, their willingness to use insane new tools like artificial intelligence and face recognition irresponsibly and far beyond their traditional counterterrorism mission. Um, I don't think that his, the, the request for additional funding is a good idea. And I sincerely hope that the funding is not added back into the bill. Um, thank you all for your time. I don't want to, yes. <laughs> yeah, very well. Thank you, Mr. Whalen. Um, um, a, a bunch of new information here for us to, uh, to also add to our uh, discussions. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, members, I am going to now pick up the, the, the pace because uh, we're going to run out of time and we don't. And I really want to get these voices in. So everyone who's listening, uh, please be as brief and concise as you possibly can. Please do not be offended if I cut you off. Um, so next, we're going to hear from Patrick Hines. We're, that's going to be followed by Gary Charwood. Um, so, uh, Gary Charwood. So first, uh, Patrick Hines from Minnesota New Newspaper Association. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Patrick Hines with Messerly and Kramer, representing the Minnesota Newspaper Association. I'm testifying with concerns about the provision located on page 74 of the DE amendment that would make... Uh, private certain juvenile delinquency hearings and records for felonies um, alleged to be committed by 16 and 17 year old juveniles. Um, first, I, I wanna thank Deputy Commissioner Shanklin at the Department of Corrections for the multiple conversations we have had about this provision and for his willingness to engage in constructive dialogue. And I look forward to continuing that dialogue during the session. Um, the Newspaper Association understands the potential harm that can come when a juvenile is charged with a felony that is part of the public record. And we're aware that that harm extends to his or her family and to the broader community. Um, the Newspaper Association also believes that privacy rights and justice reform efforts must be balanced with the need for government transparency. Transparency allows members of the public to understand the juvenile court process and how it deals with serious juvenile crime. Um, we do not believe that as drafted, this proposal yet strikes the right balance because it may in fact make certain records private that we believe should remain public. But the Newspaper Association has always been a willing partner with state agencies and stakeholders when discussing the competing needs of individual privacy and government transparency. And I commit to the stakeholders and to the committee members to work towards a more comprehensive solution to the serious issue the provision seeks to address. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Hines, for your very concise uh, sharing. And uh, we'll certainly take you up uh, uh, on, on the offer to continue to work on, on language, assuming this bill continues to move forward. Thank you for that. Next, we're going to hear from Gary Charlotte, followed by Ed Dankbar. Uh, Mr. Charlotte, please come forward. Okay, can you hear me okay? Indeed, welcome. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman and the rest of the committee. Uh, before I, I start, I uh, just want to briefly just uh, open up. Uh, I am on the Shinabe Ojibwe from Leech Lake Nation. Uh, so I just say bonjour, greetings, uh, uh, relatives and friends. Uh, it just our, our language is very important to us, uh, the Ojibwe Moen. So Mang uh, Adudem, I come from the Loon Clan. So mom is uh, from the Red Lake Nation and father resides, uh, was here, is gone now, Our but uh, from Leech Lake as well. So um, just again, I, I appreciate uh, your allowing me to have a few minutes here. So I serve uh, myself as the chair for the statewide Minnesota Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee, known as JJAC. Uh, we are Minnesota State Advisory Group uh, responsible for Minnesota compliance uh, with the Federal Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, the uh, JJDPA, and for advancing juvenile justice reforms, uh, especially uh, racial disparity reduction. Uh, first, I want to begin to uh, share a little bit about, about JJAC uh, briefly here. Uh, there is, uh, there is uh, one of these advisory groups in every state, uh, every U.S. state and territory, and staff to support this group. Uh, JJAC is the largest federally recognized state advisory group in the nation and the very first to be chaired uh, by a representative of a tribal nation, which is uh, uh, Mr. Charwood here himself and uh, Department, uh, U.S. Department of Justice uh, is proud of, Minnesota, proud of Minnesota having prioritized indigenous voice uh, in this uh, official lead leadership capacity. So I'm honored and privileged to uh, be a part of this and some really, really great people uh, to be seated with. Seated with. JJAC uh, has, has existed uh, for almost 30 years and is comprised of 21 governor appointed members, all selected specifically for their expertise, as well as almost 20 ex officios and partners that represent every juvenile justice stakeholder agency. Uh, most importantly, we have five governor appointed youth who have all had a system involvement in some form uh, they provide a valuable perspective that guides uh, our priorities. Minnesota State Statute uh, 299A.72 establishes the Department of Public Safety as a sole agency responsible, responsible for implementing the state plan for juvenile justice required under the Federal Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, JJDPA. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Public Safety is the agency that serves as home to JJAC. Uh, for the past two decades, uh, JJDPA uh, compliance and juvenile justice programming has been monitored and implemented by one single staff person where almost every other US state and territory employs a dedicated team of at least three positions whose work centers on upholding the tenets of this act. <clears throat> also Minnesota's, uh, here in Minnesota is one of the only state in the nation that relies solely on limited federal funds to meet these federal JJDPA requirements and provide grant support organizations dedicated to racial and ethnic uh, disparities. So uh, let me tell you specifically, uh, I'm gonna share with you uh, about the ethnic and racial disparities and uh, reduction work. Um, GJAC's work to reduce ethnic and racial disparities is organized into a state plan, which is updated annually by our comprehensive body based on data that is collected by OJP data analyst. And our plan uh, centers on four, a four part module for eliminating racial and ethnic disparities, which has been vetted by the Burns Institute, a nationally respected agency focused on transforming the administrative of justice. JJAC uh, has a strong ethnic and racial disparity subcommittee uh, comprised of 10 members representing a variety of sectors focusing on overseeing and implementation of our state plan to eliminate disparities. So as you can see, you know, um, our disparity reduction efforts are organized based on data and ambition. Uh, most importantly, our protocol is developed collaboratively by JJAC's powerful body of youth and experts. 
The variety of perspectives is what makes our strategy unique. However, all great plans require person power to bring them to fruition. Including uh, to my brother, Charwood, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I am pressed for time. And so okay. I, with all respect, if I can just ask you to wrap up. Okay, so uh, so the request, uh, what we're asking is uh, to include uh, some state dollars uh, to address the racial and dis uh, eth racial uh, uh, ethnic disparities, uh, delinquency prevention uh, towards uh, the Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee. So that's uh, that's our testimony uh, for today. Thank you, sir. Uh, always good to have our neighbor, An Anishinaabe neighbors uh, with us here. Uh, ah, miigwech, miigwech, miigwech. Very well. Uh, with that, uh, next we have uh, Ed Dankbar, uh, Dankbar, followed by John uh, Appitz, and I'm going to be pushing, so I'm, I'm apologizing up front here. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dankbar. Mr. Chair and committee members, my name is Ed Dankbar, Hazmat and Emergency Response Officer for CP Rail. I've been with CP Rail for 13 years. These include training, preparing for, and responding to critical incidents involving our railroad. Uh, one of my primary responsibilities is training local fire departments and other first responders on how to handle accidents and incidents that may occur along our rail lines. Typically, we do this training in person and on site at local community facilities. This past year has been different for everyone as much of our training has been done online. This online training has worked so well that last Tuesday we launched a new training app that can help us reach even more first responders than ever before. In a normal year, railroads provide training for more than 3,000 responders across Minnesota. One of the greatest benefits of our work, um, it involves getting to know, we get to get to know each other before we meet at an incident. It gives us a chance to understand the capabilities and responsibilities of each other before things happen. CP, like other large railroads in Minnesota, maintain caches of equipment and supplies at strategic locations. This includes fire suppression equipment, air monitoring equipment, spill containment boom, and transfer equipment, among many other items. One of our greatest frustrations with the state program is that as required by the MPCA, we must have our own equipment and response contractors capable of providing an appropriate response without CAT team assistance. It is unfair that we are required to pay for the CAT teams when we are already required to provide our own response. Another frustration is the competition for students uh, that has arisen with funding from the assessment on railroads. The state is duplicating much of what we have offered and provided to local responders for years. Mr. Chair, for the reasons Mr. Appitz um, will review and that I have outlined, we'd ask you not to reinstate the sunset assessment on railroads and pipelines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Dankbar. And I'm sorry that this year we didn't get an opportunity to have a fuller conversation about this. Uh, uh, we will, uh, I, I'll commit to do that uh, in the coming uh, session. Your work is very important. Appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Appitz, so if you can very quickly uh, move forward, then we're going to hear from uh, Carly Stark. I understand, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And our testimony got uh, kind of reversed a little bit. So specifically, the concern that Mr. Dangbar and I are speaking to is Article 7, Section 15 of the Delete All Amendment. I'm John Appitz. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Regional Railroads Association. That's the trade organization for uh, the railroads operating in the state. Um, our concerns about Article 7 and its line 187.6 in particular is that it would strike a sunset that was adopted when the law was enacted in 2014. Uh, in fact, we'd like to see the language that imposes a sunset on railroads and pipelines just removed altogether. And let me explain why very quickly. First, when the law was enacted in 2014, the legislature imposed a $2.5 million annual fee on the railroad and pipeline industries to get this new program up and running. We understood that the fee would be temporary and that the sunset and there would be a sunset in 2017. At that time, we agreed with the legislature, the authors, the department, not to challenge the fee because we were assured that it would end in three years. Line 187.6 of the DE amendment remove, would remove that sunset and reinstate uh, the fee. And that breaches the agreement we had with the state. We lived up to our obligation. We think the state should do the very same thing. The department has had six years, six years to find alternative funding for this program. And apparently they've decided not to do so. Most of this funding is used for uh, incidents, the largest here is used for incidents that have nothing to do with railroads or pipelines. And as Mr. Uh, Dangpar indicated, 
the training that the <clears throat> we provide for free for years is being duplicated by the department's efforts. Finally, this law flies in the face of a number of federal statutes that prohibit states from unfairly and inequitably imposing fees on one form of transportation over another. There's a recent case in California, 2018 case in the Federal Court of Appeals that said essentially there are the Interstate Commerce Commission and other laws prohibit this. They said that that act is not protected from pre, being preempted and that the fees authorized burden railroads in ways they didn't burden other uh, forms of transportation. So Mr. Chairman, that's the law and that was the original deal and we're asking you simply not to reinstate the fee and instruct the department if they wanna go forward with this that they find a, another source for this funding. We appreciate your time, Mr. Chairman, and the time of the committee. Thank you very appreciate, much. Appreciate your time as well, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Um, we'll continue this conversation as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Carly Stark, followed by Tammy Jo Lieberg. Uh, Car uh, Ms. Stark, welcome. I was muted. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Carly Stark, and I'm the Public Safety Policy Analyst for the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC would like to thank the chair for the inclusion of community supervision funding for both the Community Corrections Act subsidy and the county probation officer reimbursement. We encourage the committee to consider changing the appropriation to an ongoing base increase. Additionally, we ask that the committee members support the probation funding work group proposed in the bill to create a more equitable funding system for community supervision. AMC is also supportive of the $3 million of emergency management readiness grants to counties. It will provide much needed direct support across the state for critical emergency management functions, which include preparation and response to floods, tornadoes, public safety events, and even COVID-19. An area of concern for counties is Article 6, Section 7, which incorporates House File 856. That provision requires a judge to order a neuropsychological examination for defendants with traumatic brain injuries and other enumerated conditions. AMC remained neutral on the bill as it previously included an appropriation line. There is currently no appropriation included to fund the neuropsychological examinations, which will come directly out of county budgets. The local impact note for the same bill introduced during the 2019-2020 legislative session estimated that this bill will cost counties approximately $8.6 million, effectively canceling out any other public safety appropriations to counties that are included in this bill. We encourage the committee to fully fund the bill so that counties are not required to divert funding from other important initiatives such as community corrections and emergency management. Lastly, I want to express our support for an amendment that will be offered tomorrow by Representative Edelson to continue the 95 cent 911 telecommunication fee. It is cost neutral to the state budget and does not increase costs to phone users as they are currently already paying the fee. Though you will hear more about it tomorrow, the continuation of the fee will ensure that Minnesota has the necessary funds to upgrade the current analog 911 system to a digital system, utili utilizing modern technology. It will also ensure that counties continue to have the ability to connect citizens, citizens with the emergency services they need when they dial 911. Thank you committee members for your time and I will remain available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Stark. I, um, I, I do appreciate the um, uh, working relationship that we've had uh, with MACPO. Um, I'm always looking forward to your counsel and obviously appreciating the work uh, that you do. So uh, we'll continue the conversation over the course of, of this bill. Very well. Next, we're going to have Tammy Jo uh, Lieberg. Um, and f I, I need to figure out who I'm going to follow uh, after, that, uh, after that. But uh, Tammy Jo uh, Lieberg, I hope I pronounced your name uh, correctly. Please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Tammy Jo Lieberg. Lieber. I'm one of the legislative co-chairs for MAC Act, the Minnesota Association of Community Corrections Act Counties. Um, I'm also the director of County Ohio County Community Corrections in central Minnesota. Today, I represent MAC Act in, supporting, in support of the community supervision funding included in the House File 1078. We appreciate that the chair and the committee recognize the importance of community corrections in Minnesota. 
The governor's budget re recommends an increase of 1.22 million in fiscal year 22 and 23 to the Community Corrections Act subsidy. This represents a one-time 2% increase because the bill specifically states the appropriation is not a base increase. The budget does not make up for years of drastic underfunding and is far less than what was asked for in last year's governor's supplemental budget request in 2020. In 2020, the governor asked for a base increase to the Community Corrections Act subsidy of $3.2925 million. MAC Act thanks the governor for recognizing the importance of community corrections being provided at the local level and asked the legislature to consider an ongoing appropriation of community supervision. As a reminder, community corrections supervises 71% of adults and juveniles under probation and supervised release. The Department of Corrections supervises 17% of all adults under probation and supervised release, and county probation provides supervision for 12% of adults and juveniles on probation. That means the counties provide 83% of the services for probation in the state of Minnesota. The criminal justice system as a whole depends on effective community supervision to provide rehabilitative services and reduction in recidivism. These services are critical to providing a safe and equitable and balanced criminal justice system in the state of Minnesota. Over the last 10 years, the DOC field services budget has been increased yearly to account for inflation and higher cost of living. Additionally, in 2020, there was an increase related to staffing costs to ensure the two prisons remained open. Over the same 10 years, CCA subsidies have seen infrequent increases that amount to an average of only two-thirds of 1% increase per year. The funding system itself is broken. The funding between probation delivery systems is not equitable or consistent, which means Minnesota citizens receive a different level of service depending on their county of residence and the resources available in that county. Minnesotans deserve better. The cut proposed in the initial version of the governor's budget illustrates the crux of this problem. As you recall, that budget proposed a drastic cuts in funding for the county delivery systems while recommending an increase from, for the Department of Corrections. If the funding system is not fixed, there will become a tipping point where county systems will no longer be able to provide the majority of the supervision for the state. The governor's budget includes a proposal for a working group to study the requirements for an effective supervision system, define a core level of supervision standard, and provide a recommendation for sustainable funding options that adequately provides resources from both state and local levels. The success of this group will be critical in creating a balanced objective system to address public safety while addressing the needs of the individuals in the community. MAC Act supports the working group and believes it is vital to examine the change and change the funding system, as well as to determine a universal minimum standard for probation services in Minnesota. Additionally, we ask for consideration of making the appropriation ongoing in the event that the changes in the funding system in response to the work group are delayed. We thank you for hearing this funding request and hope to continue working with the legislature through the remainder of 2021 session. Thank you, Ms. Lieber. Again, again I'll reiterate the importance of this uh, committee uh, to interact with MACAC uh, as well as with MACPAW and with our Association of Minnesota Counties. So uh, let's keep that conversation going. Thank um, you. And speaking of that, we have uh, Schneider, Jim Schneider, President of MACPAW. Mr. Schneider, if you could be super, super brief, I'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'll be real brief. Uh, I just uh, want to thank this committee. This has been an ongoing conversation for the last couple of years regarding field services and the importance of uh, two field services. You know, we too support the supplemental budget as well as the ongoing funding for services. Uh, for over two decades, it's kind of been ignored. And so we're finally gaining flavor and we're also gaining momentum in that area. So uh, we also support the work group that's being uh, put together by the Commissioner of Corrections and AMC and MAC Act. So we look to work together in this next year uh, to really provide a balance of local control um, or provide county funding for local control with the state collaboration. Um, so I'll just end it right there. We appreciate the uh, conversations over the last couple months and certainly the last couple of years. Thank you. Thank you and to be continued over the course of the next several weeks. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to sh uh, shift uh, themes uh, a bit, and we have uh, Jelani Hussein from the Council of American Islamic Relations. If you can come forward, uh, give us your testimony. Uh, can you hear me? Indeed. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman uh, Mariani. Um, 
uh, Vice Chair Fraser and, and members. Um, I will be very brief. Uh, my name is Jaylani Hussein. I'm the Executive Director for the Council on American Islamic Relations uh, Minnesota Chapter. Uh, and I'm honored to work with a broad coalition of state organizations, community groups who have been uh, uh, prior to the, uh, the unfortunate killing of George Floyd, um, uh, worked on issues around police accountability. Um, in fact, uh, most recently, I served on the uh, Governor Dayton's uh, community advisory uh, in building community relations with law enforcement. Um, and we have been working particularly in my office uh, to address issues around uh, uh, federal uh, uh, law enforcement, around the FBI, as well as border protection. And we have had uh, an ample amount of work particularly here in the city and the counties uh, across the state of Minnesota through trainings and through other efforts that we have done. I'm here today uh, asking that uh, House File uh, 1078, uh, the, um, the Public Safety Omnibus, omnibus Bill, uh, we would like to add uh, the following uh, bills to that. Um, number one, uh, ending qualified immunity, House File 1104. Um, as we know, uh, right now, uh, the New York uh, has already moved toward that, and there are many other states that are doing this work around ending qualified immunity. Uh, the second bill is ending statute of limitation of, uh, for wrongful death by peace officers, House File 717. Um, and I know Tashir will be speaking briefly. Uh, families um, across the state of Minnesota uh, really need to have the opportunity to be able to uh, hold law enforcement accountable uh, for the killing of their loved ones. Um, also, the last bill is ending prosecution for reporting police misconduct, House File uh, 2201. We insist this language to be added and these bills to be added to uh, the omnibus bill. Um, George Floyd's uh, death is not an anomaly. Um, George Floyd did not die in any other state. He died right here in Minnesota. And while we are demanding for justice inside the courtroom and the entire world is watching right now. Uh, the state of Minnesota has not done anything significantly to make Minnesota's public safety work for all of us. And these bills are not radical bills. These are common sense bills that have been worked. They have been proven. And other states who have not killed George Floyd are now moving aggressively in producing uh, these uh, uh, bills forward and similar type of legislation to hold police accountable. Um, and that's why we are demanding that the state of Minnesota, the leaders of the state of Minnesota, police officers, police associations, and others, to take this moment and recognize what is ahead of us. The, the entire world has woken up around the issue of police accountability. We are interested in solutions. We're not interested in sympathies. We're not interested in addressing the problem as an anomaly. Um, and unfortunately, when it comes to issues like the COVID pandemic, nobody's interested in sympathies for folks. People were interested in when the vaccine will come out. People are interested who's working on the vaccine. What are the solutions? How do we keep people safe? Do we shut down the government? What do we do? Solutions. But when it comes to police accountability and police brutality, for the longest time, police departments across this country and here in Minnesota and their associations and their lobbyists have stopped any meaningful legislation that holds police accountable. We believe this is a moment that is critically important for our state, for our nation, and in order to heal our nation and move forward with a public safety that is about safety, we really need to hold police accountable, just like any other industry. And therefore, we present to you these bills that have been really crafted and developed through the tears and the hard stories of families across the state white, black, and all shapes of color who have been killed by police excessive force. For the first time, we are seeing Chief Arredondo and other officials calling out the type of brutality that Chauvin has created and killed in George Floyd, nine minutes and 29 seconds. And this is a critical moment right now. Uh, you know, uh, this, I would consider this to be the, the Emmett Till of our generation. Everyone looks at the story of Emmett Till with horror, but nothing can be more horrible than, than the killing of George Floyd, nine minutes and 29 seconds. And it's going to be a legacy on our state. 
And to all the legislators who are listening, who are going to have a chance to vote on this bill, I want you to know this is a historic moment for our state. If you fail to stand with the right and stand with justice and stand with police accountability, sadly, I promise you, your names will be etched in history with those who stood with the bull Connors of our society and those who defended a murder, a killer like Chauvin. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Hussein. Uh, next we have uh, Tashira uh, Galloway from Families Supporting Families Against uh, Police Violence. Uh, welcome, uh, Ms. Galloway. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Mariani, and thank you all for having me today. Uh, again, I am the founder of an organization uh, primarily based as a support group for families that have lost their loved ones at the hands of law enforcement. But most importantly, uh, I am also the mother of Justin Tigan, who was uh, beat to death by the St. Paul police and thrown inside of a trash dumpster August 19, 2009. And for 11 years, I have been fighting for justice for him. Um, and these bills are very important to our families. Uh, the, again, as Jelani said, is that uh, these bills are rooted and the stories of our families, and that's uh, the people that helped to write these bills, uh, heard from our families in the process of writing up these bills that we have before you today. Uh, we understand what happened in the special session before. However, uh, we feel that it was nothing passed that was uh, to um, correct the actions that or, or the trauma that has been that have been done to the families prior to George Floyd. We must understand that George Floyd is not an isolated issue. In fact, George is the face of hundreds of murders that have been permitted to happen here in the state of Minnesota based upon the laws that uh, permitted these actions to create people like uh, Derek Chauvin. We are trying to prevent further George Floyd's, and we are also trying to. Um, we are trying to give our hand out and, and not just say that we're sorry for what happened, but we're trying to change the rules that are permitting these, uh, these things to happen. There is no just moving forward at this point without addressing the grievances that are out in the community already. Uh, there are, I'll say this and then I'll let you guys move on because I know we have a short time. But I want to say that uh, if we pay attention to the murders. There has been over 470 murders in the last 20 years of uh, people that have lost their lives at the hands of law enforcement here in the state of Minnesota. And uh, those people had, uh, you know, they may have had children, uh, significant others, mothers, brothers and sisters, co-workers, uh, classmates, all of these, all of these people. If you attach all of those people to 470, that's over a million people that have been impacted in the state of Minnesota alone in the last 20 years by uh, uh, police killings. With that, um, we understand that it is it is too hard to just try to go forward without addressing the grievances that are already in the community. And the way to do that is the bills, the rules that uh, have allowed this to happen. That is all that I would like to say today. Thank you, uh, Ms. Galloway. Um, members, we still have a few minutes left, so we're, I'm gonna push uh, really hard here. We have Theo Rolls from the Minnesota Council of African Heritage, followed by Ethan Roberts of the Jewish Community Relations Council. Um, so if you can be super brief, uh, we can try to get everybody in here. So Theo Rolls. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair members. My name is Theodore Rose. I serve as Legislative and Policy Director for the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage, or SEMA for short. I'm testifying today to express support for the Public Safety Committee Omnibus. SEMA's primary role as a state agency is to inform elected officials about the needs of the African heritage community. We want to thank this committee for including proposals in the omnibus that will improve equity and public safety. First time, before I move forward, I want to commend the two preceding testimonies and just express SEMA support for the com community rep recommendations that were offered 
by the two previous testifiers. Um, we've submitted our written testimony uh, in support of several program initiatives and policy reforms in the bill. Uh, to be brief here, I, I just want to um, focus here on, on three recommendations uh, for further actions that will strengthen these, propo these uh, proposals. On public assembly response, the omnibus does not include the critical direct accountability component of this measure. If a peace officer violates the public assembly response policy, the peace officer should face appropriate discipline up to and including loss of the officer's license to serve. Please include this accountability component as a critical step toward improving relations between peace officers and the communities they serve. Citizen oversight councils, we urge the, the committee to strengthen this proposal by making citizen oversight councils a requirement and by providing the necessary funding and policy support to ensure that such oversight bodies are inclusive and reflective of the diverse communities they serve. Peace officer body camera recordings. We urge this committee to empower families by requiring the release of the recordings of the use of deadly force in two days. Mr. Chair and members, our community has longstanding experience with the ways that racial disadvantage in the criminal justice system harms civil, civil liberties and public safety. Now the public is much more aware that these matters are matters of life and death. Um, what's needed at this juncture is that we come together to put measures in place that improve peace officer standards of conduct and accountability for those standards. Thanks for your leadership in this work and thus concludes my testimony. Very well, thank you, Mr. Rose. Uh, next we have Ethan Roberts followed by Lindsay Bryce of Violence Free. Uh, uh, Ethan Roberts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Ethan Roberts, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas, or the JCRC. Among the JCRC's many responsibilities uh, are community security. And our approach to community security uh, must be multifaceted. And so there are two aspects of this bill which are very positive, and there is uh, one aspect of this bill oh, um, can you which is only of that 470. you got to mute. Sorry. OK, in, in, in any event, so because no one else has already uh, thanked uh, you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, briefly, thank you for incorporating elements of Representative Hornstein's House File 1691. Uh, JCRC is a member of the Communities Combating Hate Coalition, and the uh, language in the bill, which improves upon how we address hate crimes law, is, is most welcome and greatly appreciated. Um, likewise, we are appreciative of the ongoing commitment to funding the Supplemental Nonprofit Security Grant Program. Uh, that is actually something that's in the Senate bill. And so this might be one of those same and similar things where it's, it's in the Senate, it's in the House, the governor, so, so that is great. Um, and given how the positive, it is, it is awkward to be critical. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I do have to echo the comments from Commissioner Harrington. The lack of funding um, for um, increased staffing for the Fusion Center is a real issue for us. And let me uh, just briefly talk about one thing that the commissioner did not mention. Sorry, Agree with everything. <laughs> yes, OK. Um, right now, banker's hours means not the weekend. That's a real issue because Christians, Jews, and Muslims, our Sabbath are on the weekend. And so at a time when we have the most number of people gathering, I know it seems like for a lot of us, especially in the Jewish community, it's been a long time since we're gathering in person, but eventually this pandemic will end and we will be back in person. It, it, it's akin to not having 911 dispatch operating. We need this service to at least be seven days a week preferably 24 seven. It is not It is not at all an accident or a coincidence that if I think about some of the worst massacres, some of the worst attacks against people at prayer, it happened on the weekend. In Minnesota, the Dar al Farouk Islamic Center, the Tree of Life, the Easter bombings in 2019, all happened on the weekend. And so I realize it's a long process. I've been doing this for, for some time. I realize um, nothing is completely settled yet. And so I urge you, Commissioner, sorry, Chair, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee to work with the commissioner and see if we can at least do some of the funding, at the very least, that uh, the governor requested so that we don't have this really vital resource shuttered 
every weekend when we most need it. Thank you so much. Thank, um, you, Ms. Thank, you. thank you, Mr. Roberts. We Mr. Chair? Having those, uh, uh, Mr. Chair? Representative Grossel. Representative Grossel? Um, uh, are we going to be able to hear from uh, Mr. Hutton, Mr. Potts? Representative Grossel, they chosen not to uh, testify at this point. Uh, I do have three others. I want to get through them as quickly as possible. We are actually in communication with both the sheriff and the chief at, uh, at, at this point. They've opted not to uh, testify right now. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you, of course. Uh, Lindsay Bryce and Paul Munir. Lindsay Bryce. Thank you, Chair, for having me here today. Um, I'll be really brief. I am the Law and Policy Director for the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and I'm just here today to say thank you. Um, I, we are very appreciative that this committee has, has really owned the recommendations of the Criminal Sexual Conduct Statutory Reform Work Group and moved, moved the work of, of that large group of experts forward. We're appreciative of the Survivor Support and Prevention Grant funding that is in this bill. And then also of the Task Force on Missing and Murdered African American Women, the Office for Missing and Murdered, Murdered Indigenous Relatives, and then also the National Guard Bill, um, where the BC, BCA will be investigating um, all perpetrator, all National Guard, National Guard perpetrated and victimized cases and didn't say that very well but that bill we we so there are a number of things in this bill that are are really helpful for survivors and i'm just here to say thank you and to offer our support if there are questions or concerns or additional needs as you move throughout this process in the in conference committee thank, thank you. you thank you miss price and thank you uh, to all the good folks at violence free minnesota for the good work uh, we now have uh Paul Munir from uh, Yippa, commonly known as Yippa, uh, followed, followed by Elliot Butai, and I am, I am uh, pressing uh, a few minutes beyond the, uh, the clock here. Uh, uh, Mr. Munir. Hi, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Paul Munir. I'm the Executive Director of the Youth Intervention Programs Association. Committee members, thank you for letting me speak. I'll just be super uh, short. Thanks for including some funding for our young people, the young people living with toxic stress, trauma, or abuse. We're super grateful to see that. The, the YIP grant program, the competitive program, hasn't seen an increase since 2015. That extra $1 million for the biennium will basically keep up with inflation, and it will positively impact about 5,000 young people. So thank you for your support. I appreciate that. I hope to see it in there at the end of the day when the session is done. So do I. Um, really good work at the Youth Intervention Program Association. Next, we have Elia Butai from NAMI. Uh, and then just two more, uh, Jay Claire with uh, IWOC and Matt Ealing with Minkoji. Elliot Butai. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Elliot Butai. I'm the criminal justice coordinator at NAMI Minnesota. Uh, we're grateful for so many of these important uh, inclusions in the bill. One of our top priorities has been improving the standards and oversights in Minnesota jails. And the standards included in this bill are important for ensuring that when people show symptoms of a mental illness in jail, that they will get the care, attention, medication, and support they need. Um, and that there's accountability and enforcement of standards and policies and procedures for suicide prevention. Uh, we also support the Minnesota HEALS program, and we're grateful for the inclusion of the community safety grants, the 911 telecommunicator working group, and Travis's law. Uh, these are essential measures for reducing the unnecessary encounters between people in crisis and law enforcement. Uh, we're grateful to Representative Thompson for working with us and Representative Hollins for offering an amendment tomorrow uh, to build our already established mobile crisis teams with those community safety grants. Uh, we think that's the best use of those resources um, to build on our already existing community mental health system and avoid uh, using resources to create services that already exist. Uh, we're also in strong support of all the juvenile justice reforms in the bill. We know the prevalence of trauma in the juvenile justice system, and it's far past time for Minnesota to ban strip searches, indiscriminate restraints, and the punitive use of solitary confinement on children, as well as all the other reforms in the bill. Uh, it's really important to NAMI that when it comes to public safety and our kids, that a trauma-informed system is the safest system. Uh, and finally, uh, we support the Minnesota Rehabilitation and Reinvestment Act, the Healthy Start Act, Alternatives to Incarceration, the Veterans Restorative Justice Act. Um, all these reforms we see as necessary moves away from a punitive system 
to one that promotes recovery and rehabilitation and accountability. So with that, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, NAMI Minnesota's views on this. Very well said. Thank you, uh, Mr. Butai. Uh, we always look forward to uh, NAMI's advice and counsel. Uh, last uh, two uh, testifiers, Jay Claire with IWOC and followed by Matt Ealing with Minkoji. Uh, Jay Claire. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Mariani and members of the committee, and thank you for your time this afternoon. My name is Jay Clare. I am speaking on behalf of the Twin Cities Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee, testifying in regard to the establishment of the Minnesota Rehabilitation and Reinvestment Act. Broadly speaking, we and many of our incarcerated friends and loved ones consider this policy a welcome and necessary step towards a safer and more equitable Minnesota. It is encouraging to see the Department of Corrections bring policy aimed at shrinking a violent and unwieldy carceral system. And at the same time, we harbor deep concerns about the relatively narrow demographic eligible for earned incentive release credit as drafted. Our recommendations are twofold. One, we advocate for universal credit eligibility and the elimination of section, section five, excuse me. <laughs> We recommend that section 13, effective date on page 98, explicitly stipulate retroactive application of earned incentive release credit to time already served by those currently incarcerated, provided they have completed programming commensurate with the requirements of the policy. Requiring time served, excuse me, reducing time served in favor of a rehabilitative model is an approach with strong evidentiary support and de-incentivizing the participation of those perceived as the greatest public safety threat runs the risk of rendering this legislation cosmetic at best and counterproductive at worst. Understandably, many incarcerated people are deeply invested in the outcome of this legislation. Several of the people IWOC has spoken to this week have asked about the possibility of providing testimony and several have submitted written material for the consideration of this committee. I feel compelled to acknowledge that it is neither easy nor convenient to research, compose, and record testimony before a House committee from prison, and doing so is a gesture of intense commitment to civic participation and meaningful engagement with our legislative process. You have all gamely heard a wealth of testimony today, and I encourage you to add these voices to the ones you have already heard this afternoon and afford them their due gravity and attention. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jay. It's so important to have your voice here uh, with us, and hopefully we'll continue that uh, relationship as, as we push on good public policy uh, for the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Uh, our final uh, person uh, who's going to have all sorts of pressure to just do it super, super quick, Matt Ealing from Minkoji. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Matt Ealing, Minnesota Coalition on Government Information. Uh, I'll touch on two items. Uh, first, we would urge that the change made in line 74.12 of the bill not be adopted since it would close off access to currently public court hearings. And we always stress that in order to have full and informed debates about any issue really involving government operations, public access is critical. And in this case, the public should have the ability as it does now to attend these court proceedings to watch government operations in process. And my other comment, Mr. Chairman, is in relation to the funding that's provided to the Minnesota Fusion Center. Uh, we have submitted written testimony on this previously, so I'll just simply summarize by saying that since the Fusion Center may be receiving additional funds, and since many of its internal operations are not available as public data, uh, Minkoji favors the addition of independent auditing of, of the Fusion Center, along with a public reporting component to those audits. And as Mr. Neumeister had referenced previously, uh, such auditing and reporting had been done by the predecessor to the Fusion Center about a decade ago. And we've been in touch with Superintendent Evans uh, about having further conversations on this. And we would certainly participate with anybody that wants to have uh, additional conversations about this important matter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ealing, for your very concise uh, testimony and also for the good work that Minnesota Coalition Government Information uh, has always provided uh, to policymakers here in the state. Uh, with that, members, uh, we're going to adjourn. We will be back tomorrow for Chair Mariani. Yeah, markup Rep. Sir Johnson. Yeah, I, I just want to thank all the testifiers today, but I'm disappointed that we cannot. There's a lot because there's a lot of these things dealing with law enforcement, and the uh, because of time constraints, our uh, law enforcement contingent that uh, did want to speak on this bill were not allowed to, and they they graciously did bow out. Is my understanding so other people could testify, but we really need to hear from them. 
because uh, they have a lot of concerns on this on this bill and hopefully we can reach out to them tomorrow they can testify on it uh, during during our markup because it's important that we do hear from them Representative Johnson, I don't disagree with you at all, except for, you know, uh, what transpired today. Uh, we've been in constant co uh, communication with law enforcement throughout the day. Uh, they asked not to testify today. I, I don't know all the reasons, but I suspect it's because yesterday we spent some time with them. Uh, in fact, working on uh, some of those issues. Uh, you're going to see some of that in amendments, uh, certainly your author's amendment uh, tomorrow. Um, I would certainly uh, uh, welcome an opportunity to hear from them. At that uh, at that point, and make that exception. But uh, my intent is not to have uh, uh, a whole bunch of testimony, uh, if at all, uh, tomorrow. Uh, that was really the purpose of today. Uh, but I, I just want the public to be well aware that the posture of this chair and this committee has been to have a totally open door uh, to anyone, any stakeholder. Uh, that was certainly true, uh, and remains to be true with law enforcement. Uh, we can't force people to come and speak if they've chosen not to speak. And there may be very good reasons why uh, they do that. So just for the record. With that, uh, members, I look forward to our conversation uh, tomorrow. Uh, bring a few snacks. We'll be here for a few hours. It should be a good, good hearing. Looking forward to it. Members, until then, this committee stands adjourned.